So, welcome to Strong Field Laser Physics. It's my pleasure to, to welcome you here. Uh, we are still in Corona times. We have here very favor favorable conditions in so far as we have this uh, ventilation system. Uh, it cost me some fights with actually the university administration to, to get it installed, but I'm uh, very happy that we have it here. Um, you are required to, to wear a mask. Unfortunately, I can't wear a mask because, uh, well, if we stream it, it makes no sense. And, uh, if, uh, and we, we couldn't uh, realize reasonable audio for, for that. So I'm sorry for that, uh, but please wear a mask on your side so that at least you are safe. Uh, can we switch to camera one? Yeah. So, um, welcome again. I would start with a brief uh, inter, um, introduction to the field, um, some motivation, and maybe we switch to the, to the presentation. Yeah, so thank you. So here you see a famous movie, historic movie. This was, this was in, the, in the late 19th century, and that time, a key question in the, in the American West, yeah, so California, was whether the horse, when it gallops, uh, at one instant during the cycle, would have all its four feet off the ground. And there was a, a rich person of the name Stanford, who would later found Stanford University. So uh, the, first, the first research project, so, uh, so to say, and he, um, he offered a reward, uh, I think, of $1,000, which at that time was a huge, was a fortune, actually, uh, for the person who could solve that. And he was an Englishman, Edward Mybridge, um, actually uh, quite a character. Yeah? So I encourage you to, to look that up uh, on Wiki Wikipedia. Yeah? At one point in his career, no, in his life, he would shoot uh, another person, um, I'm not sure whether death, but uh, probably death, yeah. Um, well, and he solved that, yeah. So he was the first to, um, to arrange individual photo, photo, um, uh, uh, photo cameras in such a way, uh, and flashes and so on, uh, that one could do that. And what uh, he also then um, photographed people so in order to study their movement in, um, as a service to science. Okay, so you see the time resolution that we need here is on the order of a millisecond. And what we have reached with lasers, uh, so here I have a graph, uh, what we have reached with lasers is, well, was quickly a temporal resolution, well, actually, to be honest, already in the, um, in the late 19th century or beginning 20th century, people reached the nanosecond regime. How did they do that? So what was the high-tech instrument at that time? Any idea? Hmm? Switching, yeah, but what? Yeah, how would you switch? What was the fastest switch at that time? Yeah, what was the high-tech instrument at that time? It was the spark gap, yeah, the, simple, single, uh, the simple spark gap. And with this, perhaps together with Bockel's effect and things like that, you could realize nanoseconds, right? And now, uh, what you see here on this slide is actually um, the development of femtosecond laser pulses. And uh, with a little bit of smile, I call it Moore's law. You know uh, Moore's law from semiconductor physics. And uh, here you kind of have Moore's law um, of of laser physics. Well, here it is. Moore's law of laser physics, so you see on a logarithmic scale, uh, very much like in, um, for semiconductors in, uh, semiconductor in industries. So things went down by, well, uh, on a, uh, yeah, so exponentially down, right? And, but suddenly there was a plateau, right? And we could ask ourselves, what is the reason for this plateau? Why was there no further progress yeah, so in the late 1980s? Uh, six femtoseconds were reached uh, for lasers. Why was there no further progress? Any idea? 
Well, um, actually, the solution to my little my little uh, puzzle is, is 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 here. So what you see here is a laser pulse. It's opt of course it's envelope, right? So you see time. So it's actually longer than this pulse here. And you see the individual oscillations of the electric field. And what you see is that such an oscillation, I assume here an 800 nanometer laser, has a duration of two and a half femtoseconds approximately. So what people reached here was basically the single cycle limit. And so there was no further progress possible unless you're able to look into the cycle to achieve sub, sub cycle resolution, right? And this is actually the very point of this lecture. Yeah, so strong field uh, uh, um, laser physics is interesting by itself, uh, and I'll give further examples uh, for that. But, and I think people didn't anticipate this at the time when strong laser physics was invented. Yeah? Um, people didn't anticipate this. Strong field laser physics access, uh, actually gives you access to the subcycle uh, regime of, um, of optical periods and thus to the outer second region. And this is actually what happened uh, around the year 2000. Yeah, so one could have claimed, uh, so this here uh, really says realization of, of short pulses. Um, more generally, one uh, could also speak of just time resolution. Then uh, I could, uh, yeah, I could um, lower some of these points uh, a little bit closer to this uh, to this limit. Okay, so let us write that down, and so just take a few notes. Um, so the first point here would be. Uh, this one here doesn't work here, unfortunately. Uh, so we're still fighting a little bit with our advanced technology. <laughs> Perhaps we are a little bit too advanced. <laughs> so half of the screen remains empty for the time being. So let's start with chapter one. Start with chapter one. Um, and I call it fundamentals. So the first remark here would be just a few facts relating to the uh, to the motivation of this of this lecture. So strong field laser physics. Um, yep. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Good. Yeah. So I move a little bit in well in this direction, right? No, in, this, in the other direction. Okay, so uh, strong field laser physics is concerned um, with the unusual behavior. Well, what means unusual? Yeah, it's unusual for some years and after a while it becomes usual because uh, it's then well known. So it's concerned with the unusual behavior of atoms, molecules, perhaps also uh, solid state material. So I just make dots here um, in strong laser fields, in strong laser fields. And what's strong is, of course, relative, but we will find um, yeah, parameters that describe that. Yeah. So the second point um, is actually also quite an interesting fact. Namely, it will turn out, and we'll come to that next time, so next week, it will turn out that a lot of things can be learned, a lot of things about the behavior about this unusual behavior can be learned just by looking at the classical trajectories of electrons 
in strong laser fields. Yeah? In particular, we will, also, we will also derive the parameters with this here in mind. Yeah? So uh, let's write that down. It's also a key uh, thing for the future. Much can be learned by studying the motion um, of an electron in an oscillating electric field, namely the laser field. Yeah. And yeah, so strong field laser physics is the entrance gate for attosecond laser physics. Yeah, so strong field laser physics. Yeah, so I know that we have this problem with uh, so one of my iPads. <laughs> so I could try to, s to swap them and hope. Yeah, so let's try to swap them. Ah, I probably know what the reason was. So can you check whether this, whether the other is now here? So some things have simple solutions. So no, there's just this one and the other one. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. So let's try this here. So why I'm using two iPads? So they are actually synchronized. So uh, you would have access so you can see. So the idea is that you can see both. Yeah, now you can see nothing. It's still this one here, right? No? Yeah, it's still this one he here. And not so now it should should work better. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, so the idea is to have two um, two iPads. Then um, I can scroll back and forth yeah, because both are synchronized. Um, yeah, uh, a good idea, but it doesn't work so far, at least not here. So in my other lecture, it works. So uh, strong laser physics. Strong laser physics strong laser physics is the foundation the foundation of utter second laser physics. So I'm going to show a few slides um, on that. So what you see here, uh, once again, is this laser pulse. Right? And now we start to compare it to, to an atom. I depicted here the atomic potential. Right? You see that we have an uh, ionization threshold, if we just take hydrogen, of 13.6 electron volts which corresponds to um, a Kepler time of the electron around the nucleus of uh, 150 attoseconds about, right? Uh, if you divide it by 2 pi, then you get 24 attoseconds. We'll come to that number um, uh, later. Um, and so you see that the electron moves much, much faster than, um, than the laser. Right, so we really have to have subcycle resolution in order, in order to follow the electron inside material, inside atoms, molecules, or solid state material. And the thing that I promised is that strong laser fields, and here you have a number, right? It depends a little bit on circumstances, but uh, 10 to the 15 watts per square centimeter is for, is for for all atoms, yeah, ions are different, of course. Uh, a strong laser field, right? And then the question is, what can happen? 
And in order to give you a cartoon of that, I have the following here. Who knows this cartoon? So uh, every European knows it, of course. Yeah? So this is Asterix. Yeah? And, uh, and the idea of that cartoon is that this uh, ancient French tribe uh, fights against the Roman Empire. Right? And, they, and here is, uh, is Obelix, of course. Right? So uh, what you see, uh, this is an atom, right? So a compact thing that, uh, yeah, that, that is held together by, <laughs> by, by the orders of the, <laughs> of the emperor, of course. And here you have a strong field, a strong beam, right? And then all kinds of thing happens. Yeah? F particles fly away, right? Uh, there's a lot of noise. And there are also the physicists, yeah? So you see the, the physicists, yeah, the one has uh, just one eye, uh, the other one has just one leg, right? I'm not sure what's the matter with him. Uh, they are wondering what's happen happening, yeah? So this is us here, <laughs> kind of. Well, in a more abstract way, um, you see the particles that fly away, electrons on the one hand, ions on the other hand, and here is, well, I said the noise, but actually these are harmonics. Yeah? So it's, it's more music than noise. Um, so these are the things at which we can look in, in the lab. And the intriguing thing is that at whatever you look, you see a very characteristic effect in strong field laser physics. Yeah? And um, I would like to start um, with, um, with the physics that has been before strong field laser physics. Right? Um, so we start actually with electrons. We start, and therefore we start with photoionization. And here you see a famous person for that. Yeah, so Einstein, most well known for the theory of relativity. But when he was a young man, and uh, he was approximately, uh, so this is a photo from 1904. And in 1905, he wrote three seminal papers. Uh, so he was just 25 years old in 1905, yeah, 26 years old in 1905. Right, so uh, in the age of somebody who does a PhD. Yeah, so he wrote three seminal papers, one on special relativity, one on Brownian motion, and the one for which he received the Nobel Prize is the one that we are concerned with, namely the explanation of the photoelectric effect or of photoionization. And so what people at that time knew, and this is also quite an interesting story in the history of physics, so there, um, there was the theory of electrodynamics established by and, uh, and completed by Maxwell with this wonderful set of, of equations that are actually already relativistically correct, right? And because they were relativistic, uh, relativistically correct, they didn't fit to, to classical physics, right? And there were people before Einstein, like Lorentz, who had formulated Lorentz transformation and things like that. So Einstein actually wrote a paper on, on electrodynamics. This was the relativity part. But the other effect that grew out from electrodynamics was that people tried to prove Maxwell right or wrong. And it was Heinrich Hatz who achieved this. Yeah, so he introduced the technology of wireless transmission, but actually his idea was just to prove Maxwell right or wrong. Right? And by, by discovering electromagne electromagnetic waves, um, he succeeded to prove Maxwell right. But when doing these experiments, when working with this high-tech instrument that I already explained, namely the spark gap, yeah, so he had several of these spark gaps in his, in his uh, lab. Um, and, he, and he realized that one, when one spark gap fires, that there is a tendency of the other spark gaps in his lab uh, to also fire. Right? And he did experiments uh, in order to find out the reason. 
He didn't have much time to do that because he would soon die of a, of a really nasty um, uh, disease. Um, but still in his lifetime, uh, he would realize that the ultraviolet radiation that is emitted by the spark induces some ionization in the other, uh, of, of gas in the other spark, and that this kind of triggers uh, the other spark, right? So what people then realized is, and it is depicted here and was solved by Einstein, what people realized uh, was that you need a certain, th yeah, that, that you can't do it with red light. You can make it as intense as you wish. Well, we will discuss this sentence a little bit later. You can make it as intense as they could at that time. And with red light, you wouldn't succeed to photoionize. You need UV light, right? And then Einstein, as a young man, young and bold, he would take Planck's uh, theory of, of quantum, um, quantum behavior seriously. So this, uh, what's called later Einstein, uh, the Planck-Einstein relation, that the energy of a photon equals Planck's constant times frequency, right? And he would say, well, the energy of the photon has to be big enough to ionize, uh, to, has to be larger than the ionization threshold, as depicted here. And the photoelectron would have a kinetic energy that is just the surplus energy, so the difference between H bar and the ionization energy. Yeah? And if you would do an experiment, and I will depict a, an, an experiment soon, if you would do an experiment where you where you plot on the x-axis the electron uh, energy, so the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, and on the y-axis the count rate, you would get something like this. Yeah? So a peak at just this energy. Yeah, so let's write that down. So the um, headline is from single to multi-photon ionization. Um, so 1.1, one one. Ah, wrong iPad, 1.1 one one, um, from single to multiphoton ionization. So the first point would be here just, yeah, so in 1905, Einstein solved the puzzle of the photoelectric effect Um, by demanding, now this sounds so natural today, but at that time it was anything but natural. So understanding, you realize, has a lot to do with, with get used to a new concept. Yeah. Um, so Einstein solved the puzzle of, photoelectric, uh, of the photoelectric by demanding that H bar omega, the photon energy, is larger than the ionization threshold EIP, right? Further, um, the photoelectron kinetic energy, the photoelectron kinetic energy denoted by E, is given by E equals H bar omega minus 
Well, I shall write here the magnitude of the ionization threshold so you know some people um, give them a negative sign. And uh, let me see whether I have a figure for that. Yes, I do. So here's a figure for that. All right. Okay. Well, so I said that um, that you can't ionize with photons that are, so to say, too small. But then in um, in 1931, Maria Göppert, later known as Maria Göppert Meyer, she married a person by the name Meyer, and this person was a was a physics professor or a chemistry professor, I think a physics professor because he later became the president of the APS, of the American Physical Society. Um, so she moved to the US, and uh, she did more um, seminal work than the one that I will explain. Yeah? So what I explain is just her PhD thesis, yeah? nothing, nothing more. Uh, but she got a Nobel Prize, so she was actually the second uh, woman to receive a Nobel Prize. She received the Nobel Prize for explaining the structure of the nucleus. Yeah, so did, together with Jensen, yeah, so she did this uh, independently of Jensen, and they both uh, got the Nobel Prize for that. Um, and again, I show her in young age, um, approximately at the time when she did this seminal work in Göttingen again. And um, I read at some point that in that her PhD defense must be, yeah, must must be a very, uh, yeah, a very uh, tough thing because in the audience we're not sitting students, but several Nobel Prize winners. Yeah, so quite a few, Max Born, uh, perhaps Otto Stern, uh, so uh, perhaps Heisenberg. So yeah, you defend your thesis and you have <laughs> you have all these towering figures in the audience. Uh, yeah, you, you have to. You have to. You have to be a good physicist, I would say, in order to, in order to, uh, to excel there. Yeah. So this was in Göttingen. Uh, so actually, if you're once in Göttingen, the most interesting thing to visit there. I'm choking a little bit, of course, uh, is the cemetery there, <laughs> because uh, they have the cemetery with uh, the biggest number of Nobel Prize winners and a few other famous persons actually there uh, who could also have received the Nobel Prize. Anyway, um, I hope nobody from Göttingen listens <laughs> when I say that the most interesting thing there would be their cemetery, but, but perhaps some of them <laughs> would even agree. Uh, okay, so uh, what she calculated was, and actually um, Einstein in his uh, paper of two, uh, of uh, 1905 made already a remark in this direction. What she calculated using the freshly uh, invented quantum mechanics, Schrodinger equation and so on, right? Uh, she calculated the probability of two photon um, absorption, right? And uh, we won't do this uh, uh, here. I will just uh, give you a kind of a, well, more or less hand-waving argument how to understand this. And of course, quantum mechanics is deeply involved in that. Uh, but first, uh, let's write down the historic fact. Um, so, also ah, still <laughs> wrong. Uh, two iPads can also be confusing. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Göppert, yeah, so I don't write Göppert Meyer because at that time she was still Göppert. Uh, Göppert, in her PhD thesis, in 1931, described two photon ionization. No, not two photon ionization, I should rather say two photon absorption.
for the first time. Yeah, and you see how it works? Several photons kind of co cooperate in order to, to ionize nevertheless. Um, but why can this suddenly happen and couldn't happen before? Right, so this is uh, the interesting question. Yeah. So and the idea for that, the idea for that is that, of course, several photons have to be absorbed at the same time. Now the question is, what does it mean at the same time? Exactly at the same time, probably not. All right. So um, the issue that we have is that, um, yeah. So the atom absorbs one photon, but then there is some energy missing, right? And it would need to absorb another photon if we speak about two photon ionization, yeah. Or I can also put it in, uh, in other words. So what you need to do is to absorb two photons in a time that is short enough that the atom just doesn't know what kind of energy is needed. All right? So uh, I think you now guess uh, what I'm after. I'm after the time energy uncertainty. All right? Um, so if I have a photon of 2 EV, and I need 3 EV, then I would say, well, uh, there's one photon missing, and I just calculate the time uncertainty yeah, um, that corresponds to this energy uncertainty. Yeah, so of one photon, or you could also take the ionization threshold. right? That gives you the order of magnitude um, in which time interval the atom does not really know uh, whether there's, uh, it needs one or two photons, right? Okay, so that's the idea. Let's do the math for that. So, um, two photon ionization, so now I speak about ionization again. So, um, yeah, two photon ionization can only take place if two photons are absorbed at the same time um, at the same time uh, meaning within a time interval which I call delta t delta t that is so short that the atom can't distinguish uh, between, between one photon and sufficient photons, yeah, between one or two photons. Yeah. So, and this delta T is given by the time energy uncertainty. By the uncertainty principle. And here you see, of course, quantum mechanics at work, or rather wave mechanics at work. All right, so one could see this from Fourier's theory in principle also. So what it means that h bar 
omega times delta t, uh, so this is one photon energy times delta t, is um, smaller or equal to, um, to h bar, and this means the delta t is, should be shorter or so, should be on the order of one over omega. Yeah? So this is equation two. I'm not sure whether I wrote down here equation one, but anyway. Good. So now we want to estimate the required flux density of photons yeah, or the required intensity. Yeah? So the flux density of photons, flux is how many per second or so, right? And flux density is then how many per second and square centimeter or square meter, whatever you wish. So three here, is that point? Um, so estimate the required flux density. In optics, we call that intensity. Yeah, and this um, word is actually wrong. Yeah, we use it in optics all the time, but if you would ask a some person who is doing radiometry, uh, he understands or she understands uh, some, uh, some different quantity under um, this word. So um, what we do is that we start with the probability, and I will denote it as P1, with the probability to absorb one photon. And I will introduce the concept of a cross-section for that. Right? So the probability, probability P1 for one photon ionization is given by P1 equals sigma this is the cross-section times n, this is the flux ten de density, and then the pulse duration, right? So let's write these quantities here. This is the cross-section for one photon ionization. This is the flux density. Um, yeah, the photon flux density. Yeah, the photon, yeah, so number of photons per time and um, per time and and area, yeah, and cross uh, and area. And this is the length of the interaction, so the pulse duration. Yeah, so if I irradiate an atom for for 10 seconds, then the ionization probability is, of course, 10 times larger as if I do it for one second, right? So this uh, seems to be quite natural. So the pulse duration. That's equation three. Yeah. And um, just a note here. Yeah, so the unit of n times tau, this is one over square centimeters, or square meters as you wish, right? Uh, and this means that the unit of sigma is centimeter squared. Yeah? Makes sense. Okay, so how large is, um, is the cross-section, you know, just a typical number um, for, for the cross-section uh, for ionization? Well, on the internet I found the following. Uh, it doesn't uh, fit too well actually to, uh, to, to the situation here. It's a little bit small here, the number, so let's look at it on, 
um, on my slides on this figure, right? So here you see the cross-section of elements for different photon energies, right? And unfortunately, the photon energy, they, are, uh, they use mega electron volts. So uh, it ends here at kilo electron volts. Uh, but I think we can kind of, uh, we can kind of, yeah, um, uh, of continue this, uh, this figure in our mind, right? And what you see is that at low photon energy, so this goes up, right? And uh, we will eventually add up in uh, the 10 to the 6 or so order of magnitude, yeah? And the unit here is barns per atom, yeah? And barns, this means, in German, this means Scheunentor, yeah? So a big gate, yeah? So, uh, and for, for nuclear physics, one barn is actually <laughs> quite a big thing. Um, and uh, here we speak even of mega barn. Right, so a typical order of magnitude for the cross-section um, of single photon ionization in the parameter regime we are concerned is the mega barn. So we write that down. Um, a typical order of magnitude for one photon ionization Um, with visible light and of course I assume here um, atoms not ions with visible light is one mega barn corresponding by def definition to 10 to the 6 times 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared Okay, so that's single photon ionization. Now we want to expand this concept to two photon ionization. And the idea is that we ask ourselves, well, when, the, um, when this is the probability of single photon ionization in this time, in the pulse duration, then I could also easily calculate this probability in this time delta t that's allowed by, by two photon uh, for, well, where the atom can't distinguish single and double photon ionization, right? So I could immediately say that in this time delta t that two photon ionization would be just the product or the square of this thing here. Yeah, so in a time delta t, which is probably in the outer second region, in this time, uh, the uh, double ionization would be just the square of this thing here times delta t, right? Okay, uh, let's write that down. I'm not sure whether I explained it uh, very well, but I hope that if I write it down, uh, it becomes clear. So um, let's say the following. Yeah, so from equation two, it follows um, the probability for one photon ionization in a time interval um, where the atom can't distinguish um, energy differences of one photon energy of h bar omega 
is obviously this equation two, but just written with delta t. Yeah, so this is P1. Um, is obviously, well, I just write uh, the equation. So the sigma times n times times tau, uh, delta t, right? And this means the probability for two photon ionization the probability for two photon ionization is just the square of that. Yeah? For two photon ionization, I have to be more specific. For two photon ionization in this very short time, right? In in delta t is sigma times n cross-section times flux density times delta t squared, right? But now I have a pulse of length tau, which is much longer than delta t, right? So I have this probability at the beginning of the pulse, then delta t after the beginning of the pulse, and so on and so forth, right? So therefore, for the total pulse duration, it's this probability times tau divided by delta t, times how many, how often delta t fits into the pulse duration, right? Okay, so during the pulse, this probability Uh, no, sh I write this can happen. Yeah, so this two photon ionization, this can happen tau over delta t times. So then we have a formula P2 equals sigma times n times delta t squared times tau divided by delta t. And now we plug in um, numbers. Well, I could have, yeah. Um, so what I do is, um, yeah. So I have sigma squared. Then I write n, the number, the, the photon number, the photon number flux density. I write with intensity divided by h bar omega, intensity by divided by the photon energy, right? So intensity divided by h bar omega, of course also squared, everything, right? Then we have delta t, and for delta t we found actually that it's equal to one over omega. So if we go up here, yeah, so equation two, so um, we have, um, one over omega squared, and yeah, perhaps I should, yeah. And then we have tau and um, delta t is once again one over omega squared, so it's in the numerator. So tau times omega. Yeah, and uh, what we get then is sigma squared times the intensity squared intensity squared divided by h bar omega, uh, by h bar squared omega to the third power actually, and the pulse duration. This is equation four. Yeah? So I should explain this again. Um, yeah. Um, so we said, so we started out with delta t, right? We started out uh, with this delta t, where we said that within this time, the atom is not able to distinguish between one and two photon ionization. We said that 
the probability to, ion, uh, to absorb one photon is given by this here. And if it is just in this short uh, time delta t, then I have to replace this tau with delta t. Right? So this is the probability to absorb one photon. The uh, probability to absorb two, which is now allowed, yeah, because the atom can't distinguish between one and two photon ionization, is, of course, the product. Right? So the probability, um, the combined probability of two independent processes is always the, the product. Right? So this is what's written here. This is what's written here. Right? And now we have looked, so now suppose you have a pulse of a nanosecond length. Right? And now we have just looked at a time interval, a slice of that pulse of the duration of a few tens of attoseconds. Yeah? And so this probability can happen as many times as delta t fits into tau. Right? Okay, and this is what's, what's written here, and if you do the mass, quite trivial, um, then you end up at this formula, which is an interesting one, yeah? which is a very important one, because what you see here is the hallmark um, of, of actually perturbative behavior. Yeah? And strong field laser physics is where this breaks down. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, so, as expected, we see that this probability P2 for two photon absorption is proportional to the intensity squared. Yeah? And this is the hallmark This is the hallmark of perturbative behavior. And, um, yeah, and perturbative means that the laser is a small perturbation to the electric fields inside the atom. Yeah? So this is meant uh, with perturbative behavior. Yeah, so the laser is a small perturbation of the atom. Yeah? And this sounds a little bit funny because uh, if you have this uh, really powerful lasers that people were able to, to build, uh, then to speak of a small perturbation sounds a little bit funny, but it's actually the case because um, because the fields in an atom are so, so strong, right? Good, let's go to, the next, uh, to a slide and illustrate this a little bit, how this uh, took place. Two photon absorption. Uh, this is the first observation of two photon uh, uh, absorption, two photon excitation. Yeah? Excitation means, of course, or implies uh, that the photons are absorbed. And here you have Wolfgang Kaiser. He's still alive. Yeah, so he did this uh, in the US when he was a young scientist in the US. And if you look at this, uh, at this date, then you see it happened just after the invention of the laser. Right? Just after the invention of the laser, this thing here happened. Um, yeah, so he later became professor at um, at the Technical University in Munich, and he was one of the pioneers of femtosecond lasers, a leading figure um, in uh, ultra-short lasers in Germany. And he's still alive. Uh, I hope at some point, uh, so he will reach the age of 100. Uh, that would be nice to, um, that would be nice to see. Yeah, so he was still around when, when I did my PhD in Munich, so he was just retired at that time. And here's another famous experiment, namely uh, the generation of optical harmonics. We'll also talk about harmonics, I said. Yeah? So that's the music in strong field laser physics. Here, uh, the music is not so rich. Uh, it's just second uh, harmonic generation. 
And uh, Peter Altenfranken uh, was the person to do that. Ah, yeah. Um, and uh, of course, there's a funny story about that. Uh, you probably have heard it. So anybody who uh, attended my lecture on <laughs> nonlinear optics has heard it. Right, so uh, they uh, measured the second harmonic, right? And there's an arrow indicating where it, that the second harmonic, yeah, so this is the first harmonic, was blooming, yeah, so overexposed. And here was the little bit second harmonic. And at that time, they still had a copy editor at Fusserev Letter. And he realized that piece of dirt here <laughs> and removed it. <laughs> so he removed the effect from so he published nothing. Uh, yeah, so a very funny story. Um, short lasers. Yeah? So uh, lasers were intense, but at that time they weren't intense enough in order to, in order to um, break perturbation theory. Yeah? But before we come to that, let's continue a little bit on that. Um, because what we want to do is to write this equation in a little bit uh, different form. We want to write this equation for P2 in the same way as the equation for, for P1. Yeah? So this is now my fourth point here. So equation four may be written As, or it may be written similar to P1 in some sense. Yeah? Then we would write P1, uh, P2 is equal to now not sigma squared, but the two photon cross section. And then we would write it like this here, of course, yeah? in order to, uh, to make it consistent equation five, yeah. and we thus define, thus defining the two photon cross section. Yeah. And this photon cross section is measured in units of GM, capital G, capital M, and it means Gerbert Meyer, is measured in units of one GM. Yeah? So let's do an example and see uh, how big this, uh, this thing is. Or uh, we actually will put it around and we'll ask ourselves how much intensity do we, uh, do we need. So um, an example. So which intensity, intensity I is needed for a 1% probability for two photon ionization ionization this way right um, for an atom Um, with uh, sigma, typical sigma, so one megabarn. And we use a wavelength here of 1800 nanometers because then omega equals 10 to the 15 per second, yeah, radians per second. And we'll assume a pulse duration uh, that wouldn't be very typical for two photon ionization, I would say, but anyway, typical for us of 100 femtoseconds, right? Then we solve equation four for the intensity and we get 
that the intensity equals h bar squared omega cube and now p2 this is 1% right uh, then we have the pulse duration 100 femtoseconds and we have the cross section not the two photon cross section here but the cross section squared so and now we plug in numbers right and of course uh, this looks a little bit ugly i have to say right so h bar h bar squared you know h um, this is 6.65 or so 10 to the minus 30 uh, 34 joules times second um, if you divide it uh, through uh, 2 pi and uh, here squared of course then you get 10 to the minus 68 then we have omega so we said 10 to the 15 to the cube is 10 to the 45 10 to the 45 then we said that we want to have a 1% probability so this is 0 0.05 um, in the denominator, we have the pulse duration, 10 to, um, 100 femtoseconds means 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Wow, what kind of exponents, right? And then we have a mega barn, 10 to the 18, yeah, so one barn was 10 to the minus 24, so mega barn 10 to the minus 18 squared gives 10 to the 36 minus 36. Whew. Yeah, and um, of course in units of, in units, in SI units, oh, I need this still here, of course. Um, so we have joules squared, seconds squared, seconds to the minus three, then seconds for the pulse duration and centimeters to the fourth power for the cross section squared. Yeah? And if you do that, and if you do that, then you get 10 to the 12 watts per square centimeter. Yeah? Okay, I said already that this is a more or less untypical um, pulse duration. Yeah, it's a more typical pulse duration for, for something uh, old-fashioned like two-photon ionization, if I may say that, uh, would be a nanosecond laser. Right? And if we use a nanosecond laser, then this laser has a pulse duration that's four orders of magnitudes longer, and accordingly, uh, the intensity required would be, would be two orders of magnitude less, so 10 to the 10 watts per square centimeter, which uh, is actually a very reasonable estimate. Okay. Good, yeah? Well, this is necessary, such lasers, such intensities are necessary for multi-photon ionization. But now if we speak about um, the non-perturbative um, things, then um, stronger lasers are necessary. And these are uh, nowadays mostly chirp pulse amplification lasers, right? So the problem, problem is, the problem is not to to get enough laser energy in order to achieve high intensities. The problem is that you need material that sustains that, right? And if we have ionization of the material, then uh, it will also ionize uh, your laser rods and your mirrors and all that stuff, right? So uh, there is a principal limitation, it appears, right? But laser physicists weren't the first people to encounter this problem. There were people in other fields of, of science and engineering who had this problem before. Does anybody know? Radar technology. There you want to have a powerful radar pulse emitted such that you can detect the little bit of radar reflection, right? And therefore, well, building a big amplifier, big electronic amplifier, is probably not uh, so much the issue, but at some, times, uh, at some point the current is so high 
that you just evaporate your amplifier. Yeah? And what these laser engineers did was to stretch the pulse, yeah, so you stretch the electromagnetic pulse, uh, we also have electromagnetic uh, pulse, by the way, to stretch it, to amplify it, to compress it, to send it out, and then to detect whatever comes back. Right? Same idea here. The question was just how to do that, how to stretch a pulse and how to recompress it. And actually, the genius idea of these two persons here, uh, Donna Strickland actually did her PhD Right? Again, a Nobel Prize for a PhD work. Uh, so the key insight was that uh, there are things like these matched stretchers and compressors so that they would perfectly, uh, um, as a, at least without material in between, they perfectly, so such skins perfectly can, can recompress things. Right? So one produces a short pulse, say 20 femtoseconds long, one stretches them to whatever is necessary, depending on the pulse energy, yeah, can be to the nanosecond region. One amplifies them, as you see here. Stretching the pulse means that you reorder the colors kind, kind of, right? So that um, the red color comes first, and then, the, and then the blue colors. Low frequencies come first, then the high frequencies. We call this a chirp because uh, birds, birds chirp, you know, right? And uh, if birds would look to our human music, they would say, oh, pretty boring, yeah? Because it's just the tone. And they, in order to impress a female, they would, uh, they would just modulate the frequency. They would chirp, right? And such a pulse in acoustics would sound like hooey, right? But birds, uh, birds uh, uh, chirp so quickly that you can't hear the, the hui or hi yu. Um, yeah, they just chirp, and they chirp actually up and down in a complicated manner. OK, so this is how this was achieved. Yeah, so you see uh, Donna Strickland. Uh, he obviously is a French guy, but was working in the US at that time. Uh, she, as you see here, is from Canada. Canada. Yeah, golden uh, maple leaf here. Very beautiful, I have to say. Um, Donna Strickland, um, at that time working with Gerard Moreau, I guess in Michigan at that time, um, invented that. And with these kind of lasers, you can produce intensities uh, yeah, that actually go much beyond what we are doing here, namely to the relativistic region. OK, so next point. Yeah? So we are about to break, to, break perturbative, uh, to break perturbative behavior. And the person who has discovered that uh, is Pierre Agostini. I don't know when he was born. Uh, he is uh, retired, uh, meanwhile, actually. He was retired from his position in France uh, many years ago because he was working at an institution that has atomic in its name. And for everything that has to do with atomic nuclear in France at that time, they retired these people at the age of 60. Right? So he was still quite, quite young when they kind of kicked him out. Yeah. And so he was hired in Ohio at the Ohio State University. But I think he, but meanwhile, he retired also from there after another, I think, almost 20 years there or so. Yeah, so this is him at a younger age, obviously, right? And what he discovered in 1979, still without chirp pulse amplification, um, was what's called, somehow it's a misnomer. Uh, well, I clearly say it's a misnomer, right? that the atom absorbs more photons than are necessary for ionization, and they call it above threshold ionization. I forgot to put um, a title here, above threshold ionization. Yeah? So um, that's um, 
chapter 1.2, characteristic effects in strong field physics. So this is the first one. We're dealing with electrons, yeah? So 1.2, ah. <laughs> uh, 1.2, characteristic effects of strong field physics laser physics I prefer to write no characteristic effects of strong field laser physics so um, So once the intensity increases such that the field strength, that the electric field strength of the laser Um, becomes or reaches, let's write, reaches um, the inner atomic field strengths. Don't take this too literally. So actually, if you are at a percent level of the field strength or so, we are close to that region, right? So several percent of that uh, is already sufficient. Reaches, we will specify this more clearly later. Reaches the inner atomic field strength non perturbative effects are observed. Yeah, and the first one, so, and this is chapter 1.2.1, .1 is what's called a buff. above threshold ionization. Yeah, and, and the effect, I said it already, uh, the atom absorbs more photons than required for ionization. Uh, so uh, let's look at this uh, again on the, on the slides. Uh, so this is the situation. Uh, so some atoms absorb just or actually most atoms absorb just the number required for ionization, but there are some that um, absorb a photon in excess, right? And therefore, in the photoelectron spectrum, you not uh, only see just one peak, but you see several peaks, right? And there was a lot of fuss about uh, this phenomenon. Um, it was pretty new when I did my, uh, well, yeah, it was a little bit more than 10 years old when I did my, my diploma thesis and later my PhD on exactly this topic here. And um, I still um, remember vividly how people were, were uneasy about this effect. So the 
present understanding that we have, and that s sounds so natural for us, was just starting to develop there. And uh, as it is a basically classical picture that we have for, well, for the first order understanding of this effect, it was, it was, it was touched at that time only, uh, well, as, uh, yeah, so it was a ick uh, theory, right? People didn't like it. You have to, uh, you have to imagine what happened uh, when lasers were introduced. People started to understand these multi-photon processes very well. In all details, um, angular distributions of photoelectrons, resonance and effect, all this was understood and it was applied for, for powerful um, um, analytics methods, uh, for example, in physical chemistry, right? So people were actually quite confident and proud of what they had achieved in multi-photo ionization. And then this thing came and people realized that there's no chance to describe this with perturbation theory because this perturbation um, expansion, this power series expansion, failed to converge, right? Um, so this was, uh, this was a kind of a, of a mystery, this thing. And um, I, as a young student, stupid and naive as I was, looked at it and said, well, the atom can't count. Why shouldn't it absorb more photons than necessary for ionization? And I think this is basically the, I think it's still right, all right? So uh, it was just my naive answer at that uh, time, but I think it characterizes things uh, quite well. Um, good, let's just, ah, <laughs> my pet. <laughs> I really need to make this thing work. So here is, uh, is this figure, yeah? Okay, but this wasn't uh, the end of the story. Um, and actually, I wouldn't say, I, I would actually say that this was, seeing this fence of, um, of absorption, yeah, I think is not the, when I speak here of characteristic uh, effects, and we write here above threshold ionization, the, the fact that more photons are absorbed than necessary for ionization, I think is not really the, well, uh, the clue of the thing, yeah? Um, so this is a measurement uh, that I did, yeah? So a real measurement, I took xenon atoms, so pretty close to that uh, situation here, yeah, at that time with a, I think I still show it. Um, and you see these ATI peaks, yeah? And then I increased um, the, the intensity, and this thing here appeared, right? And uh, for, for perturbation theory, this is, of course, a slap into its face, right? Because here you see um, uh, an obvious breakdown of perturbation theory because um, a higher order is even more probable than a lower order. How can, uh, how can, can things converge? Right? And uh, of course, this was a um, this was a challenge. Yeah? But again, um, we'll show that. Yeah, so I explained that each of the things that you can look at, namely electrons, ions, and photons, um, each of them shows a characteristic effect. Uh, this is the first one here, and uh, we'll see the two other ones. But the uh, interesting thing is that also the theory for, um, for all these three characteristic effects is essentially, essentially the same. Yeah, it's just different aspects of the same theory. Uh, so quite nice. So this was above threshold ionization. Um, and uh, yeah, so the characteristic effect, the characteristic non-perturbative effect is what's called a plateau in, um, in above threshold ionization. 
Uh, so this was my PhD uh, achievement, so to say. Um, yeah. For sufficiently high intensity, a plateau-like structure is observed for the envelope of the photoelectron spectra. And our goal is, of course, to understand this as well as the other effects in, in a lot of detail. Yeah, so that's the content of this, of this course. Good, let's go on. I have to hurry a little bit up. Um, so the next one is that we look for ions. So this is 1.2.2. And this is called non-sequential double ionization. Non-sequential double ionization. So a slide for that. And also the the person who dis dis discovered that, Anne Lelier, will hear about her in a few minutes again. So what she did in probably her PhD, I would guess, right? So the French at that time, they had built the most powerful lasers. Um, and they are still ambitious in this, uh, in this respect. Um, yeah, so they have the most prominent companies uh, that are building high power lasers. At that time, it was not trip pass uh, amplification. Now, this came a little bit later. These were still lasers with a, f a fairly long pass duration. But uh, she looked at um, the ionization and double ionization of, um, of atoms here, xenon, right? And now the, the simple thing uh, would be, or the simple scenario you can imagine would be that, yeah, cons uh, yeah, keep in mind that we have a long pulse, yeah, that such an ion, such a xenon uh, atom is ionized once, right? Uh, then uh, this ion core may be a little bit excited still, but it quickly relaxes, right? And then during this long pulse of so a nanosecond or so, uh, it's ionized a second time, yeah, because there are enough photons, right? And what you would guess as an educated quantum mechanics person who has in mind perturbation theory. Yeah, so you would expect that if you need, say, eight photons uh, in order to ionize it, uh, xenon once, that it goes with the, that the, count, the counts of ions yeah, on the y-axis here goes with the intensity, if eight photons are necessary, with the intensity to the eighth power. Right? You would generalize just uh, what I did for, for two-photon ionization. Right? And indeed, you see that yeah, because this slope, yeah, so if it would be eight-photon ionization, it, this slope on this double logarithmic plot would be just eight. Yeah? Of course, you see that it, that it kind of saturates there, uh, but the explanation for that is trivial. Yeah? At some point, you will have ionized everything and then, of course, uh, you can't do more than ionize than to ionize everything, right? So it has to do that at some point, right? Now, the ionization threshold for the ion is, of course, higher than the one for uh, for the neutral xenon atom. So you would expect for double ionization, which is depicted here in red, a bigger slope, and you see that here, right? So this is what was expected. Now it's dashed here. Right? Uh, for a smaller uh, photon energy, it's the same thing here. It's dashed here. Right? 
So, but you see a huge deviation from that. It doesn't, on first glance, it doesn't look that huge. But you have to uh, take into account that we are on a logarithmic scale. You see many, many, many orders of magnitude more double ionized xenon atoms, xenon ions, they are xenon at uh, atoms, than expected from perturbation theory. Yeah? A huge challenge. And Anne Lillier wrote a wonderful paper where she just said, well, there's a third pathway where uh, the electron is taken directly from the ground state to the double ionization. And she wrote down a cross-section for that, for the non-sequential double ionization. Very beautiful paper. And then there was another physicist by the name Peter Lampropoulos, who, was, who is a famous person in multi-photon ionization, in particular uh, the older, yeah, um, so he, he actually uh, was a big uh, person uh, developing uh, this entire theory. And he pointed out in a paper that the cross-section that Anvillier gave is many orders of magnitude beyond one, what one would expect from theory. Right? So this was a big puzzle. Okay, so let's write that down. Just uh, one quick thing here. We just uh, do it with one sentence. Yeah, so, um, the probability for double ionization at, yeah, at low, I put it in quotation marks, intensities. Now yeah, still 10 to the 13 like yo is much much larger than expected from perturbation theory Okay, then to the last thing, because I have to conclude here, but uh, we need to finish that at this point here. Um, high harmonic generation. And this is the other big achievement by Anne Lullier. And it's actually a huge achievement. Uh, so she did a few years later, in 1988, this was published. She just used the laser to shoot at a cloud of gas, a diluted gas. Uh, and they looked at the harmonics. And uh, what they saw was kind of, uh, on first glance, what one expects. Um, a lot of third harmonic generation. There's no second harmonic generation. Everybody who attended nonlinear optics knows why. Right? Um, there is much less fifth uh, harmonic generation. Right? And then already the surprise comes here. Yeah, so, uh, similar to what I showed for photoelectron, um, uh, for the photoelectrons, yeah, but she was a, a few years before me. Um, there is this plateau-like thing here. Yeah, so there's a plateau in high harmonic generation, which means that you can generate these harmonics, this XUV radiation, fairly efficient. Right? And actually, it turned out that they are phase coherent, which means that you can, it's similar like mode locking. Yeah, so if you know about mode locking, where you have many modes of a laser, and if they, are, if they have the proper phase relation, it turned out that they do have the proper phase relation. Uh, actually, interesting story. We'll come to, to details uh, well towards the end of this course. You can produce utter second laser pulses. 
Yeah, so here you see the direct uh, path of, um, um, of strong field laser physics to other second laser physics. And uh, Anne Lillier explained uh, many aspects of that. Um, of course, nowadays our lasers are so strong that we can drive. So also the efficiency of this effect is, well, in the, uh, in the range of 10 to the minus 6. Uh, so if you have a kilowatt laser, as like uh, people like uh, Jens Limpert here uh, in Jena is producing them, uh, you can produce XUV radiation uh, with yeah, micro or even milliwatts of, of power, uh, such that at least in this spectral region, uh, region uh, these laser-generated XUV radiation is similarly strong than what you get from a huge synchrotron, right? So, uh, and thus it can be used for many things in science, right? So you know that synchrotrons have a huge field of applications. Uh, and now uh, some of that is open for, uh, for laser-generated radiation. And my prediction is that she will uh, receive a Nobel Prize for that, sooner or later, Anne uh, so uh, this discovery is, and there's no question, I think, uh, is worth a Nobel Prize. Yeah, I think this is a good point to, to conclude here. And, well, you have seen in my email that I wanted to cover today actually also atomic units. But, uh, yeah, I like to tell stories, and I did this. T I overdid it, I, I'm afraid. So it took me longer than anticipated. See you next Thursday after Easter. So happy Easter bunnies. Um, was there a question? No. OK. Goodbye. So there's no seminar today. OK. So let's finish uh, this stream.